Good evening. We're still struggling a bit with technology, but I still want to go ahead and uh, welcome you very warmly to the session on the future of Canadian diplomacy. My name is Oliver Schmidt, and I direct the Center for Global Studies here at Quebec. Before I start off, uh, let me acknowledge with respect uh, the, the Kwangun speaking peoples on whose territory the university stands and the Kwangun. One of the Samish peoples on whose, and whose relationship to this land continues to this day, so I consider us guests on their land. Let me start this session by giving a great shout out to um, our friends from the CIC. Our many members will be here tonight, and Chris Kelford, who is the president of the uh, Victoria chapter of the CIC. It's been wonderful uh, for you to bring these great speakers. You know, we have a panel of very distinguished speakers tonight, and Chris, I'm sure we wouldn't have needed the pieces to bring people out to, with these kind of experts to shed light on something that is truly a critical question. If you open your news feeds, you look at the newspapers, and you see the conflicts internationally that are brewing. On the one hand, you see the declining ability of traditional diplomacy to do what diplomacy does best, find compromise, bring people together, um, find forms of conflict resolution, and I'm not speaking about making a deal, but a different kind of diplomacy that doesn't rely necessarily on Twitter or other forms, but the good old art of finding compromise by negotiations, by listening to each other. So in this respect, I think it is a very timely session that we have today looking at this from very different experts' perspective. Um, one housekeeping note, um, this session today will be both maybe live streamed, but for sure recorded. So if you don't want to be on camera and we make this recording available later on, please let us know so we make sure you don't appear there. Um, with this, I would like to hand it over to Phil Calvert, with um, the regional head of the Retired Heads of Mission Association here in Victoria will lead you or introduce uh, today's session and we are very glad that Puma also uh, collaborate with us bringing all these speakers out. So um, enjoy the session and fill over to you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, thank you, Oliver. I think Oliver has positioned this panel very well in terms of what's happening internationally, so I'm going to uh, uh, move on and I have the honor of introducing the panelists this evening. Um, I have to you refer to notes because so many of them have such uh, distinguished careers and I have to confess to them I had to edit their careers because they've done so many things. Uh, but, they, but, but they're looking at, uh, they will look at this issue of diplomacy from a number of different perspectives. Um, also three of them have come from out of town so we're very delighted they were able to, to come here and participate in this event. I'm going to start uh, from right to left. So Pam Eisfeld uh, is, uh, has been a Foreign Service Officer since 1993. She served in Nairobi, Sarajevo, and twice in Afghanistan, as well as most recently in Warsaw. Uh, she um, also is the first full-time president of the Professional Association of Foreign Service Officers. She's been doing that since 2019, so she brings this uh, uh, professional uh, uh, person who's in the middle of the field right now with respect to this, uh, to this event. On her left is Patrick Brown, uh, CB, former CBC of Radio Canada correspondent, who has uh, 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 been based in London, in Bangkok, New Delhi, and Beijing for many years, uh, almost a decade, long time. And uh, he has uh, covered, of course, events in Europe, events in Asia. And uh, it, since up to 2012, uh, his memoir, Butterfly Mind, was published by the House of Nancy in 2008. And he lives on Pandora Island, so he's coming from Pandora Island. Uh, Jill Sturt is a former ambassador and assistant deputy minister in Global Affairs Canada. And she's had postings to Norway, NATO, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the United Nations, and Poland. In fact, she has recently returned from a short-term assignment at Chargé d'Affaires, uh, acting ambassador in Moscow. Uh, Jill is a frequent commentator on foreign policy and diversity issues and is the co-author of Diversity Dividend, Canada's Global Advantage. <coughs> Mark Lortie, uh, finally, uh, has been a diplomat ambassador 
Prime Ministerial Spokesman and Advisor to various Prime Ministers on federal provincial issues, Latin America, and European affairs. He served as the Prime Minister's personal representative for La Francophonie, a Sherpa for the Summit of the Americas, Assistant Deputy Minister for the Americas, as a fellow at the Center for International Affairs at Harvard, and has represented Canada as ambassador to three countries, Chile, Spain, and France. So let me ask you to give a warm welcome to our panelists. The format of this will be, we'll have about a 60-minute uh, panel discussion, moderated by Chris Kilford, who's president of CIC, uh, followed by a 30-minute Q&A. So uh, I'm looking forward to a very vibrant and interesting discussion. Chris? Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Phil. And thank you to the panelists for coming uh, this evening, and thanks to all of you for coming out as well. I've got a, a number of questions that I'm going to be asking the uh, panelists, and um, it's a bit structured, but we're hoping it will eventually be more free-flowing, and I'm going to keep time at the end for questions from the audience. So if you've got something uh, burning that you want to say, uh, you'll have a, have a chance later on as we move through uh, this evening's activities. So I'm going to start um, with uh, Jill. And uh, this question is not going to come as a surprise to Jill. We wouldn't want to do that to our panelists. But, um, you know, we live, as, as you know, in an era of 24-7 news cycles, uh, instant communications, and social media platforms. And the big question, I think, on, on a lot of our minds is, is, is old school diplomacy still a useful tool to have? And, and, if, and if it is, what skills and abilities does a diplomat need in this world today? Perfect. That's great. All right, you can see how good I am at technology. Um, but uh, I would say, what, you know, lots to chew on here, and given the state of the world, uh, I would argue that diplomacy is more important um, than ever. Uh, we're operating in an era of instant connectivity, and there are both positive and, and negative aspects to that, I would say. Um, certainly there are countless sources of information out there, there's greater transparency, um, but uh, it's... Um, I think sometimes we have to, to think a little bit about the, the quality as well as the, as the quantity. Um, to me, it always seems a little bit like doing di medical diagnosis on the internet. Um, there are endless possibilities. It's often pretty dramatic, but um, it isn't always uh, entirely accurate. So um, I would say many of the crises that we face today, and I, I you know, kind of look around the world, whether it's Asia or uh, the Middle East or the situation in, uh, in, in Europe, are really in part the result of politicians taking maximalist and inflammatory positions and then broadcasting those views uh, to their followers rather than thinking about undertaking the serious negotiations and, and discussions uh, that actually might lead to, to problem solving. Then you add to that the, the high degree of skepticism about anything that governments do today um, and I think it, it presents a very challenging situation, but one in which uh, there is a very important role for diplomacy. So I thought what I might do is talk a little bit about what it looks like for Canada's diplomats on the ground. Um, I think as Phil mentioned, I had the opportunity uh, to spend the summer uh, in Moscow, uh, covering off in the, the absence of an ambassador. So, by way of background, it's been more than five years since I worked at Global Affairs, um, even more since I've been out on a posting. So, before I went, I wondered, am I actually going to remember what I'm supposed to do um, as a diplomat? Uh, would I have lost those diplomatic skills? Um, but the prospect of spending the summer in Moscow, which is one of my favorite cities, um, practicing the Russian that I had learned at, at university, um, and doing the work that I loved was just too good to pass up. And I said to myself, besides, it's summertime, how busy can it be? <laughs> well, <laughs> turns out, as usual in Moscow, it was pretty busy. Um, we started off with demonstrations uh, on a weekly basis uh, around local elections. Uh, thousands of young people out demonstrating on the streets. 
uh, and a heavy and heavy-handed uh, police presence in response. Um, and so we had to be both on top of what was happening, uh, along with all of the other news uh, makers, but at the same time, we also had to try to work out what was driving this and um, what was driving the response and what did this mean in, in terms of the bigger picture. Um, in addition to the, the weekly demonstrations, uh, we also had the matter of uh, a number of Ukrainian sailors who had uh, been taken prisoner uh, and were being held by the, the Russian authorities. Um, again, not a lot in the public domain about that, but pretty important uh, negotiations, uh, especially as a, a kind of an essential precursor to any kind of uh, discussions between Russia and Ukraine about uh, some of the other issues on the table, the occupation of the Donbass and so on. Um, and I think because of Canada's uh, uh, support for Ukraine, it was really important that we uh, understand what was going on in that process, that we monitor the, uh, the trials that were taking place uh, in Moscow, um, and that we be ready to, to make representations. Um, in addition to all of that, of course, there were a number of human rights cases, political prisoners, uh, human rights defenders uh, underway at the time. And once again, I think, you know, Canada has always had a, a tradition of being very much engaged uh, in support of human rights defenders. Uh, so working with the NGOs, working with individuals, uh, monitoring trials, making our views known to uh, the Russian authorities at, at different places and different levels. And then, uh, in the last couple of weeks I was there, there was a small matter of a, a, a rocket test gone wrong with nuclear fallout. And of course, everybody wanted to know what was happening um, with that. So, all, during all of this time, um, certainly there was real-time information from both um, Western and, and local sources. And I soon learned who I needed to follow on Twitter to find out what was, what was happening. But we also understood we needed to go deeper. And um, the media will often tell you what, where, and when, uh, but sometimes uh, not doesn't go in uh, as deeply to the, to the why and, and the how. So let me go back to some of what I think are the essential uh, diplomatic skills. Um, and, and they are traditional ones in, in some respects. And let me start, I would say, with, with knowledge. The kind of breadth and depth of knowledge uh, about global and local context. And um, to any sort of aspiring diplomats out there, I would say never underestimate the importance of understanding the history, the politics, the culture, the traditions, and the myths, and the realities that shape a society and shape others' thinking. Moscow today might look like any other European city, uh, but you don't have to be there too long before you realize that, in fact, there are some very different uh, forces at play. Uh, the second point I would say is really about relationships, and diplomacy is all about relationships, um, and you're only as good as your networks. Um, and you need those networks, you need to build that shared understanding and trust so that you can convey your views uh, to the other side, and that people will trust you to tell you what they're thinking and what uh, might be going on behind the scenes. Um, really important to create that wide network of, uh, of partnerships. Um, and especially with those who don't necessarily share your views or, uh, or objectives. In the case of Moscow, that proved to be a wide range of NGOs, think tanks, business people with different kinds of connections uh, from, from us and, of course, uh, our traditional uh, and non-traditional diplomatic colleagues um, so that we could uh, perhaps find ways to partner together on issues or at least better understand what was happening on the ground. Um, the third thing I would say is timing. Uh, timing is everything, and diplomacy requires patience, um, extraordinary patience, strategic patience, an instinct to let issues play out and to be ready to step in um, with the elements of the solution when the, when the time is right. Um, sometimes you need to move quickly, but uh, often the lasting solutions to complex problems uh, require uh, time, you know, time and uh, space to build consensus. Uh, and then last of all, I would say resilience and creativity um, you need to be in for the long haul. And I think too often we get uh, ex you know, ex um, sort of distracted by the next kind of shiny thing in the window. Um, but often some of the most important issues really require uh, long-term engagement. 
um, willingness to try new approaches, new direct diplomacy, finding new partners, leveraging resources, um, thinking about uh, engaging uh, civil society, and um, finding out what the other side needs uh, in order to move forward. If I can, if I can yeah. Just a couple of trends that I, that I see that I think are quite important for diplomacy. Uh, first one is, is youth, something politicians are not uh, very well equipped to understand. Most of us sitting here on the panel as well. Um, but it's clear that youth are far more engaged uh, than in the past and are shaping events. I think of Moscow, where the protesters were largely young, Hong Kong, uh, and of course the, uh, the climate marches that we see today. And um, civil society is, is key to democracy, and I think youth is a really, really important part of that. Second element, I would say, is the strong desire of uh, middle class everywhere, really, for, for freedom of speech, rule of law, participatory democracy. Too often autocrats, I think, think they can kind of buy the population off with consumerism. And sometimes that works for a while. Uh, but I think eventually most uh, countries where you have a, an emerging or a strong middle class uh, see those other elements as key for their long-term uh, prosperity. Um, social media, powerful tool for sure for raising awareness and advocacy, especially in authoritarian societies. Um, uh, invaluable this summer uh, in, in Moscow in some ways um, in terms of focusing on exposing human rights abuses. Um, but it can also be impressionistic, self-centered, um, biased, and belligerent. Um, and it's not very useful for addressing complex issues like energy, environment, health, cyber. Um, and it's too often, I think, focuses on the problem, but not really on, on the solutions. Um, you asked about whether we were nimble. Um, yeah, I, I, didn't ask you that. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. Are we ready? I mean, Are as you ready? see it today, you've been in the field in Moscow, mm -hmm. and you were away for five years. Has anything happened? Has anything changed in that five years that really struck you? Well, I would say, as always, we have some wonderful, talented people in the field um, doing extraordinarily difficult and, and sometimes dangerous work. And um, I think the, the level of the complexity has, has changed in some respects. It's certainly uh, faster. Um, looking over the, the sort of the past year or so, I see three examples where I think Canada has been particularly nimble. Um, the instance when we brought the uh, white helmets out of uh, Syria, uh, the group engaged in um, volunteer search and rescue, a brilliant operation um, led by Canadian diplomats, young Canadian diplomats who were, I think, behind much of the, the work on that. And then partnering with a range of partners, you know, the US, the UK, Israel, Jordan, um, to pull, uh, to pull this off. So really brilliant piece of diplomacy in my mind. Um, the whole reaction to the refugee crisis, uh, also a, an important piece of diplomacy where I think Canada was nimble, moving our immigration officers out into the field rather than waiting for refugees to come to us. Um, and then the third one is the renegotiation of the uh, US-Mexico-Canada uh, free trade agreement, uh, which I think required building all kinds of strategic partnerships, um, both in Canada, in the US, and in Mexico. Lots of work behind the scenes, and um, ultimately, uh, you know, a successful outcome, um, which really, you know, if, you, if you've been using a lot of social media and broadcasting some of the messaging around that while it was going on, would not have been, uh, would not have been successful. So real old school diplomacy at its best, but operating in a very different kind of environment. This actually leads into a question that I have, have for Mark, because Mark, you were our ambassador to France and Spain and Chile. You've had a variety of other positions at high levels, and Jill mentioned a number of things that have happened successful uh, diplomatic efforts that have happened recently. But um, we don't want to get too political here, but when the new government came in a few years ago, it was uh, the talk was that we were going to be back into the world after perhaps a period of contraction. When you look at the scene from your perspective, do you feel that Canada's back uh, today? Let me give you a diplomatic answer. <laughs> we are moving, but we're not back yet. 
we are moving in the right direction on all kinds of fronts. Because when a new government comes in, they have to face their main priorities. And the main priority of the government in foreign policy remains threefold. The first one the Prime Minister or government will look at is how is my relationship with the United States of America? How is it? Is it properly managed? Should we go deeper? Should retract from, from that relationship? What will be the consequences? It is always the first consideration. And on that score, I will give full marks, as Jill just explained, to the government. Not only are we back, and it was easy to be back when President Obama was running the administration. With President Trump, it is mind-boggling. Therefore, you don't know where you stand, and you don't know what he's going to do, and how much damage he's going to do. And the role of the embassy in Washington and the role of the diplomat is to prevent that damage to the country on all scores, but the first one, the most obvious one, is on the economic front. You know, if we are, if you tear down a trade agreement that was a successful tool for the Canadian prosperity in the last uh, 30 years, therefore you have a challenge. You have an immediate challenge. And therefore, the government did well. We always said, you know, I was in the Foreign Service for 42 years and I started in 1971 when Trudeau Père was the Prime Minister. And one of my first tasks as a young officer was to deal with the so-called third option. How do we reduce our vulnerability vis-à-vis -vis the United States? Long history, especially for the students here, but you know, one of the biggest shock was the, the, the Nixon, the so-called Nixon measures of August 15, 1971, when Canada was hit brutally, brutally in its, uh, in its economy by the Nixon measures. Therefore, the government at the time, <clears throat> from 71, 72, 73, reflected about the relationship with the United States and concluded that we need counterweights. We need to reduce our vulnerability vis-à-vis -vis the United States and have counterweights. Well, the counterweights arrived three years ago when we concluded the comprehensive agreement with Europe and the European Union. 500 million people, the largest economic bloc in the world, 28 countries, the most innovative and creative uh, agreement that we have signed, and therefore a counterweight arrived with this government, and I would say a plus. And then Asia. Asia is the region of the world that needed for Canada to, to have a, a, a strategic framework to better work and operate and defend and promote your interests in Asia. And after all kinds of, you know, tergiversations of all type, you know, uh, finally, the government agreed to embark on the TPP, and therefore, another counterweight to our dependence with the United States is the growing relationship with Asia, and I will say, I will give a plus. In the middle of that, the 
government, when the government said uh, we want to be back, and we're going to be back, well, in order to be back, you have to invest. And you have to invest in your diplomatic tools. And if you're not prepared to invest in your diplomatic tools, well, you know, it's nice rhetoric, but it is not a convincing rhetoric. It took us a long time to say yes, to send some peacekeeper to Mali. <clears throat> it took us a long time to re-embark on the multilateral front. And we considered a little bit too superficially the challenge of India and China. And now we are confronted with a huge problem with China, and it is not easy to find a solution. Therefore, is the government, I would say partially, yes, on the big ticket item, and a lot, a long road to recover our dynamism, our world presence, and the place that Canada should should assume in world affairs. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mark. And I'm, I'm going to skip over to uh, Patrick because we've heard from Jill about the importance of history, and we've heard from Mark also about Canada's role in the world and, and where we're going. And, I, and we've also heard about the 24-7 news cycle. And of course, Patrick, you were uh, part of that news cycle as well. And I, I wanted to ask you, and it's not in the script per se, but um, how do you look at the world yourself today compared to when you were in the field in so many locations? Are we, are we better off than we were? Or are things just the same as always? Will we get a seat on the UN Security Council after all this? That wasn't in the script. <laughs> that was. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that, that you know, I'm usually on panels with journalists and academics and other kinds of experts, and it's kind of daunting to be outnumbered by people who actually know what they're talking about <laughs> from the inside. Um, uh, but luckily, television journalists uh, have one key skill, which is to appear to know what you're talking about. Uh, so I'll deploy that. Um, are we better off? I, I think, incontrovertibly, we're better off. I mean, I think by most statistics around the world, you know, child mortality and, and, and uh, diseases and things like that, for all the miserable and outrageous things that happen every day on your iPhone, um, I think things for more people are better. I think the internet is, is absolutely fabulous. I, I really do, and I think it's had an overall net beneficial effect on just about everything from uh, you know, booking a taxi to uh, traveling to the other side of the world in half a day. I mean, um, these things are remarkable, and the problems that we have with the internet, the problems we have with media, social media, the problems we have with the way our democracies have been kind of subverted by, by all this, um, I think are still outweighed. I hate to sound optimistic because it's not my natural uh, mode, but, but, but overall I think if you, want, if you want a summary of are things better, I would say yes they are. Um, are we doing enough to make sure that the, the darker side of all this doesn't overtake us? I don't think we're doing enough to, to make sure that I look at it with absolute horror. Um, just, just the things that are happening in Washington today and London yesterday, and, and the reason those are happening are, are to do with um, the, the perversion of politics by, by, by this 24-hour um, fire hose of, of misinformation, disinformation, and actual information that we're all subjected to constantly. And I think part of that, if we're looking at it from the point of view 
of diplomacy, I think that, that uh, perhaps the masters of the diplomats sitting in their capitals think, well, what do we need these guys for? We're getting, we're getting enormous amounts of information every second from Ulan Bator. Um, but, but precisely what, what you need to understand all that from a journal, journalism point of view, um, I'm very careful what I read and trust. I need to curate this information that's coming in. And if you don't have diplomats, diplomats out there, not telling you what's happening in school today, sure, we know which way the Congress uh, has decided something. We know that there was an explosion in Moscow. We know that the, 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 uh, the students are back on the streets in Hong Kong. It's, it's not a question of this is what happened in school today. It's like, what does this mean? And I think that um, diplomacy has a key role to play in that. And I think rather like looking at the United Nations, there are so many things to complain about looking at the United Nations, but why not start by imagining what the world would be like without it? And I think the same goes for, for, for diplomacy. What, what would our, our country and the rest of the world be like if, if our political leaders and, and, and people who make decisions in, in Canada were not informed and, and guided by what diplomats are saying. Um, as far as judging whether whether diplomacy is better than it was or worse than it was, I don't, I don't really feel equipped. But one of the things is that if diplomats are doing their jobs right, one of the things they have to do is keep people from me knowing what they're doing and how they're doing it in real time. Because that the fact that it might appear on the front page of the Globe and Mail or on the national on television tonight uh, might well make it impossible to achieve whatever it is you're trying to achieve. So, so I don't, I didn't very often know what was going on. I didn't feel it was my job particularly to, to, to follow every in and out of the diplomatic community. Um, the country I was in the longest, almost 20 years actually, um, I think 17 years of living in China and 25 years of, of covering it as a journalist. Um, that's the country where I most see the day-to-day -day work of, uh, of the diplomats. Otherwise, I would tend to be jumped into somewhere for a couple of weeks when there was a crisis going on. And you would see how an embassy would handle a crisis, but you wouldn't know about all the stuff that actually makes the people go around. Um, I do think, looking back over all of the ambassadors that I've met, dozens and dozens of countries and embassies that I've had to react, interact with. It's, I think, almost without exception, worked better when there were professional diplomats doing it than it has when there are patronage appointments or political buddies of the Prime Minister or, or, or people who apparently are uniquely qualified because they have business jobs. Um, I, I think I think diplomacy is a profession and it works better when you don't appoint people to it who are essentially amateurs in that profession. Um, and I don't think there's anybody who's going to argue against that on this panel. <laughs> anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And it's perfect because you're leading into, of course, a question for Pam about di diplomats and the professionals, the non-professionals, the, the political uh, folks that, uh, and business folks that get put into diplomatic positions at high levels. So, looking at all of this and everything we've heard here, what's your take on the diplomat of today? Ooh, a, a nice general question. I like. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you. So, I represent, I mean, I have, we have a panel of, of a couple of ambassadors here, and at PAFSO, I represent the, the officer level, the worker bees of the, of the Foreign Service. So my last assignment was as the head of the political section, effectively deputy head of mission in, in Warsaw, Poland. And I've had other assignments at that level. I was a deputy director in, in my last assignment at headquarters before I left to become the, the full-time president of PAFSO. So we look at things sometimes we share a lot of perspectives, but sometimes we, you know, we have a, a slightly different angle on on things from the from the, the trenches sometimes. And you know, it's it's interesting how um, there are things in, in common, and sometimes there are things that are different. I mean, 
in, um, from our point of view at the officer level, there is now about, we figure about 17 to 18% of FS positions are filled by non-FS. So the people who, from other categories like um, ECs, economists, policy analysts, PMs, program managers, uh, COs uh, on, the, on the trade side. And we don't think that there should be no people, no other people in FS jobs. I mean, we recognize that you know, from time to time, there's specialized expertise, that there is, uh, you know, there, there sometimes there are jobs that are hard to fill. Um, all of those reasons, I mean, we do see a role for, for people from other categories, but we think it should be more in the order of about 5%, um, rather than, than what it is. I mean, we think, it's, we think that it's too high. And the reason for that is, um, in some cases, I think some of the bigger picture things like this erosion of the idea that uh, diplomacy is in and of itself a skill. I mean, when you talk to people from other categories, from other government departments, they tend to see themselves as specialists and they see us as generalists. And so they think that you know they can do our job sometimes even better than we can because they will bring this extra, this specialized aspect, whereas, you know, especially as a political officer, sometimes I used to get frustrated because I'd feel like everybody would say, well, Everybody reads the newspaper, so you know everyone watches the news, so everyone understands politics, and everyone could could do could do our job. And you know, one of my roles in, as the full-time president now of PASO is to rebuild this idea that diplomacy is a skill and a profession in and of itself, um, and that rotationality is a skill, you know, and a capacity that not everybody has. I mean, not everybody can move around from country to country every you know, every two to four years and uproot themselves and their families and their kids and, you know, live and work in a different language and live and work in a different legal system and all of these things. I mean, some plenty of people can do that once, but how many people can do that six times in, in 25 years? It, it, it does require a, a, special, a special set of skills. On the question of the heads of mission assignments, I mean, we also agree that, you know, Patrick uh, sort of touched on it, but, you know, my line that I use often is, in every profession, there is, you know, the sense that a, a senior, the best qualification for a senior level assignment is a series of pro progressively more responsible jobs at lower levels. Why on earth is that such a hard sell in diplomacy? You know? Um, after the you know the, the stuff came up in, in China, and the, you know then ambassador was was you know it was in the news. A reporter asked me what we what we thought of that, and I said, well, I'm not going to comment on anybody specifically because I mean certainly somebody who's been a minister, you know, you can't argue that that person doesn't have some skills that would that would lend them you know that make make them uh, qualified in, in some aspects for certain things. But it's much easier to learn certain lessons about. You know, the difference between establishing a rapport with someone and having a friendly relationship and so on, as in, and, and you know, really being able to trust someone at the junior level, you know, rather than when you're, when you're at the top in, in such a high profile position. So our position is that, you know, really when possible and unless there is some other uh, reason, you know, you need to be. You need to think through these assignments, and you also, if you're going to have political appointees, you need to think about the resources that are needed to support them. You know, so you need a very. You know, sometimes you might need a, you know a, a, an extra position, an extra deputy, or people who can support people and fill in some of those gaps, because they, you know, they often bring other skills to the table, other connections, things like that, but not necessarily those. You know, that that history of, of diplomatic work. Thank you for that. And, and while we're on the subject of of our professional diplomats in the field, Jill, I, I'd like to, to turn to you and talk about our gender, our diversity balance in the in the uh, diplomatic world. Because in 2018, you know that Open Canada still, said we still had a long way to go. And I know this is an important topic for you. Well, let me start by saying how important I think it is that the Foreign Service be representative of the, of the country that it, um, that it represents. Um, uh, it's important in terms of, of equity. Uh, it's important in terms of the skills and experiences that it brings to the Foreign Service. But it's also important because um, it's the face that we show to the world. 
And uh, when we send people abroad who represent the full spectrum of Canadian diversity, that is a message uh, in and of itself to others about uh, the values that are important for our society and the kind of um, skills, I think, that, uh, that Canada that has, to, has to offer. Um, in terms of, you know, what's uh, the progress, I guess, that's been, been made or not made in, in Canada's foreign service, um, I have been out of the, the picture for a little bit, so I, I hesitate to comment on sort of the day-to-day -day operations there. Certainly, the Foreign Service looks very different from when, uh, when I joined, both in terms of ethnic diversity and, and gender diversity, and that's a positive thing, and I think there's room to do more, and um, I hope that, that work is underway to, to make that happen. What I would say is that um, I think that it's not just about a focus on numbers, it's really about changing a culture so that people feel welcome and able to express diverse views within uh, an organization. And that, uh, that really starts at the top. It's all about leadership, uh, about ensuring that you create an environment where people do feel uh, able to, to contribute. I have to say, personally, I had a, a very positive experience in. Uh, in the department, and I mean, you know, everybody has, you know, the stories they can tell about, you know, um, fossils and <laughs> attitudes and so on. But overall, uh, I found it. A, I had a very you know, rewarding career um, uh, with, uh, you know, with supportive colleagues and, and fine mentors. Um, but. I think, on the other hand, I would say I also became quite accustomed to the culture. Um, and I don't know whether that's a good thing or a, a bad thing. It's just a, a reality. Uh, and I know that the culture is changing, and it has changed, and it should continue to change to be uh, more reflective of um, different attitudes and, and approaches. So I think I'll leave it there. And just on that note, Pam, coming back to you briefly, are you finding it, or is, is it becoming more and more difficult to get people to go overseas today? Um, oh, <laughs> wow, no, I have a choice. Excellent. Um, it's hard to say. You know, I think that there always is a constituency of people who really want to go out for their first posting. You know, those, that's where the bottleneck seems to be, and, and there are people who feel like they're waiting a long time to get that first assignment. What happens though is, you know, when Global Affairs hasn't done a proper recruitment in, in seven or eight years, you know, depending how you look at the last one, if you think that that was a proper one, and the, the requirements, the qualifications for people keep going, going up and up. So, you know, more, most people have a master's degree now, uh, whereas when I started back in 1993, uh, I think half or slightly, slightly less than half of us had a graduate degree. Um, the average age of a recruit in the last, last round was 37. You know, people were also required to have overseas experience already. And, you know, this all, requiring all of these things increases the age of the, of the people who, are, who are, are joining. So, you know, I was 27 when I joined, and uh, if I had been making some of those decisions 10 years later, I don't know that I would have found it so easy. So there are those kinds of demographic issues. We also find that uh, more and more of our posts are, are high hardship levels and things are happening that, you know, people are facing difficulties there that, that we did not really anticipate 20 years ago. I mean, I never ever thought I would be in Afghanistan, not just once but twice. And since I did that, um, you know, there have been many, many other people deployed there into missions in Mali and Haiti. You know, the world is in some ways getting a, you know, getting to be a more dangerous place in the places where diplomats and foreign service officers are needed. So, you know, that affects who can take those jobs, right? Because some of them, you, you know, you simply can't take a family or spouse with you. And if people then have to decide if they're going to be separated from their, from their partners, it's, a, it's a, difficult, uh, a difficult decision. We've also been finding things like even posts that were considered, you know, very safe and sleepy, like, like Havana. I mean, Havana was a, a family post. It was, you know, it was interesting, but really, you know, very secure in, as far as living there. And, you know, we've had the, the recent incidents with, uh, with diplomats, you know, facing severe medical issues from an unknown source. So, 
you know, I hear from people in Paris, they tell me that they have not been able to, uh, you know, to go out for, you know, eight, ten weekends in a row because of riots and, and unrest in Paris. I hear from people in missions in the U.S. that they're worried about school shootings and, you know, about, about demonstrations and riots and all those kinds of things. So, you know, all of these things are, are making the, 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 the idea of a career in, a foreign, in the foreign service, I think, maybe a little bit less glamorous for certain types of, types of people. But then luckily there's always the other type of person, which is more like me, that, you know, wanted to do the hard stuff. So hopefully we'll, uh, we will still be able to attract those people. But it's my job at PASO to make sure that those people, when they go out, are appropriately supported and protected in what they're, what they're doing for Canada. I'm going to just uh, go to the bigger picture, uh, back to the bigger picture again, and that's talking about the UN Security Council and the, uh, the fact that we're in contention with Norway and Ireland for a seat on the Security Council. We haven't had a seat in some 19 years. And the question is, do we deserve it? I mean, do we deserve it when we know our foreign aid budget really hasn't moved very much? Our military is more focused on NATO missions, and we have very few peacekeepers in the field right now. Now that the Mali mission is over, probably no more than 30 or 40 uh, Blue Berets currently deployed around the world. It's a far cry from, from where we, we were once before. So the question is, to all of the panelists, and I'll start with you, Mark, because we spoke about uh, this Canada being back, do you think we're... Do you think we've done the right things to, to have a seat on the UN Security Council? Is it important that we're on the UN Security Council, even if for just two years? Um, let me start with your second, second part of your question. Yes, it is important because the big ticket item are discussed and tackled at the Security Council. Therefore, the question of war and peace, of tension, of injustice in the world, and more and more questions such as, you know, should we bring climate change issues at the Security Council level? Not only the question of peace, but the social issues, climatic issues, economic issues. How do you trigger uh, a better economic development in some poor countries. Therefore, where do you discuss it? Well, you could discuss it in all kinds of forums, but no forum is better place to address those issues than the UN Security Council. It's a problem because we are part of a club, you know, every region of the world uh, uh, sit on the Security Council on a rotation basis and we are always uh, compete with our friends and like-minded countries for a seat. Therefore we are competing with Norway and Ireland and for the vote of 193 countries including our vote. Um, that is going to happen. You know, when I look at Ireland and Norway, uh, and us, we are all, uh, well, let's say we're not superpower, we're not, uh, uh, you know, rogue states, we are just great contributors to the multilateral system in one way or another. The Norwegians are just first class, but they are extremely targeted. They are targeted and the, in terms of conflict resolution, the Norwegians are just top of the class. The Irish, well the Irish is a pacifist country, in a neutral country, but they're part of the big club. They have achieved a tremendous transformation in their country in the last uh, uh, 20 years and more since the financial crisis. Oh, it's a great country. And us, well, we're not a superpower, but we are a super country. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a, we are just a fabulous country. We are part of the G7, we are part of the G20, we are a member of the Commonwealth, 
We are an active member of La Francophonie. We are a useful member of the OAS. And we play a role, an active role, on the Venezuela question as we speak. Uh, therefore, we have our, our place there. At, at every 10 years, you know, you go and, but we're going to compete. One thing will make the difference if we're going to win or not is the involvement of our political level. The fact that the Prime Minister nor the Foreign Minister were at the UN uh, General Assembly uh, that opened on Monday is a great plus for Ireland and Norway because they were there en masse at the political level, chit-chatting everybody, because everybody is in New York during that period. The vote is going to take place in June, but you have to lobby, you need a year or two to lobby. And once we get out of our election cycle, well, I would advise strongly the governments and the new prime minister or the re-elected prime minister to get going on it if he wants the seat badly. Last time, I can tell you, we lost, not by much, again, two great friends also, Portugal and Germany. But the Prime Minister, it was not in his DNA to get engaged and to get involved. And personal diplomacy is irreplaceable when you are looking for something on the international stage. You need to engage your Prime Minister, Foreign Ministers, trade ministers, you have to make sure that everybody is lined up with one objective. For the government, after October 21st, has this possibility to not only to realign, because I think that the, all the series of objective are, you know, rather moderate objective that uh, we put forward, I mean, it's a Nobody could disagree with that, and it's, uh, it, it's just fine. But it's the will combined with an expression of a vision of what Canada could contribute to the betterment of world affairs in the next two years. Not an easy task, but a doable task. Joe, would you like to comment? I don't know what there is to add to uh, <laughs> to all of that, but I would I would say that I um, I agree with Malcolm on all of it. In fact, but in particular, if there's an advantage that I think Canada would bring, it is uh, that we have a global perspective. Um, both Ireland and Norway are fine candidates and would make a fine contribution to any organization and they are engaged in, in different ways. But I would say that although Norway does undertake a lot of this uh, kind of conflict uh, resolution, they are largely uh, a regional uh, actor uh, and Ireland uh, the same. Um, whereas I think Canada does have this, this global perspective. We are an empower of the Asia Pacific. Uh, we are certainly very much part of the Americas. Um, we have long-standing ties to, to Europe, and I think um, historical um, engagement in Africa through uh, originally missionaries of development assistance and through our membership in the Francophonie and Commonwealth. And I do think we bring that, that very global perspective that the others don't offer. Um, the other, uh, I think, uh, advantage or attribute that we would bring goes back to the question of diversity uh, and in terms of, of diversity of a country that has is multi-ethnic, multilingual and has largely built a model in which people can 
uh, live their diversity uh, in a respectful uh, environment. Um, I think Canada is, is, uh, is far ahead of, of almost uh, any other nation. Not that we don't have our faults and that there isn't room for improvement, but um, I think it's a pretty uh, attractive model. And I think for, for many countries that should be, um, if they're thinking about the values aspect of, uh, of a Security Council election, that should be something we should try to draw on. Thank you for that, Patrick. I know you were you were pro UN in some of the comments you made, and I was wondering, from your perspective, how you feel about us getting back into the Security Council. I think it would be quite nice <laughs> if we had uh, a consistent and coherent um, approach to these big picture items. Uh, Mark was talking about like-minded countries and um, there's an awful lot of upset on the international stage um, because of two extremely large countries that uh, one the united states is is sort of in this, in this ridiculous political cog and you don't know how it would go or what it would do from one moment to the next but then china makes a very studied and careful effort to um, pervert the course of justice in international affairs and overturn, or, or sort of bend these institutions to its own way of seeing things. Um, and I think these like-minded countries, uh, each pursuing its own political agenda, uh, are maybe not doing as much as they could to sort of try to preserve and, and, and promote the... Uh, uh, the democratic values, the human rights values, and the, the sort of general approach to making societies better that, that we all share, but somehow we don't apply the amount of collective will to it that we possibly could. And if Canada had that desire, um, a seat in the Security Council would help to uh, sort of cement an effort in that direction. Rather, and we're missing just in the last couple of years that the, the international community has missed two very strong candidates for the use of the word genocide, one in uh, Burma, Myanmar, with the Rohingya, uh, the other happening in China right now in Xinjiang with the uh, Uyghur people. And um, the silence uh, and the willingness to accept these things because it might upset uh, these big players is, is outrageous. I find, too, that we, we underestimate ourselves on the world stage. We forget that we have the 10th largest economy. We forget that we spend billions in foreign aid. And we're a top defense spender as well. And, and for me, Mali was a great example because we put our military peacekeepers into that operation. And it was a big deal. It was dangerous. It was frightening. But at the same time, a lot of the gold mines in Mali are run by Canadian companies. We have our diplomats on the ground. We have a long association with, um, with uh, Quebec universities working in Mali. All of this going on every single day. And I, 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 I say you know, we tend to under, underestimate, underestimate ourselves. But just to conclude the, the panel portion here tonight, what, um, Pam, I'll start with you. What do you think the, the biggest challenge now facing us going forward? Uh, in the diplomatic world is going to be? Um, I do think that it is maintaining that idea of a professional foreign service because I think that you know, as everybody is yelling at each other and you see you know, tr the trumps of the world on the international stage, just the idea that you know, there is value in trying to speak to the other and, and in maintaining a group of people who have the skills and capacity to do that, I think um, it's kind of, it's under threat, you know? We just did a strategic review for PAFSO. It's the first one in our 54-year our history. And when I was going through some of my things, I found that, um, you know, we've been talking about some of these questions for a very long time. I found papers that had been written, you know, by colleagues that some of these folks would know, you know, back in 2001. And people were sounding the bell then saying, 
we really need to do something about this, and the situation is only getting worse. So, I, you know, I'm really glad to be at panels like this and, and see so many people interested in the discussion, because I think it's something that um, we're going to be looking to the public and, and people out there to say, hey, this is valuable, and we, we need to, you know, it's worth putting some uh, some resources and some effort into. And uh, Jill, going forward. Um. I think that one of the greatest risks for Canada is that the institutions that we have depended upon so greatly are, are really under such stress. And uh, whether it's the UN or the G7, um, they're, they're institutions that have been critical to Canada's influence in the world, and they're just not entirely fit for purpose anymore. And as a, uh, the international community writ large uh, continues to struggle with how uh, to reshape those institutions into something that would be uh, perhaps more, more viable. But for Canada, I think this is a greater risk than, uh, than for others. Um, I would also say we're operating in an environment where compromise has become a bit of a dirty word and um, liberal internationalism, democracy, uh, is under threat. And uh, that makes it particularly challenging for us to make our voice uh, heard on all of these important issues. Patrick, going forward. Sees the, uh, the solution to everything as a hammer, but uh, and, and somebody who spent a lifetime in China sees the problem of everything in China. But I think that is the biggest challenge for Canadian diplomacy uh, to 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 how to cope with this giant. And I think one of the the problems of this, and it goes back to Chrétien, continued with Harper, and it continues to this day, is the belief that somehow trade trumps everything. Um, and that if only we're just doing more business with China, China is suddenly going to turn one day into a democracy and the rule of law and we're all going to live happily ever after and that just isn't the case. And here we are right now with uh, a second problem with an ambassador, uh, an ambassador to be, in that the new nominee has a history of working with a company that has extremely distasteful uh, contacts in China, in Xinjiang, where the Uyghur people are under threat, and in the South China Sea, where one of his clients has been building these islands uh, for military purposes. And his his wife is um, a sort of hedge fund manager with deep interests in China. And somehow, because he has business skills, he's the guy that we need to have in China. And it, it, it's you need a more nuanced, a more broad, a more, more uh, comprehensive approach to how do we deal with this? And how do we not become a hostage to this trade relationship where our citizens are actually being kidnapped to put pressure on us because of a legal problem that I think is too complex to go in here. But, but um, really, that... It's difficult dealing with the current administration in, China, in, in the United States, but it's going to be gone in, four, in two years or six years, or change at least. Whether it changes for the better, we don't know. Uh, China is, uh, has no immediate prospect of changing. We're not dealing with it with the subtlety and uh, deafness that we need to apply in this asymmetrical relationship. Thank you. Mark, I'll uh, last word to you. Um, Patrick, I fully agree with you. The rise of China and what China is, uh, is doing is a major challenge for a country, for a country like Canada, for, for us. And I really feel that we are not uh, properly equipped to, uh, to develop a strategic approach to it. Uh, when, when we, are not, we are not doing it or or striving to it, and, uh, and that, is, that is a concern. But it is the reason also that you see decline a, a decline in world institutions that have been built in the last 70 years. In the last 70 years, since the, the end of the Second World War, it is the Western world that built those institutions to serve basically the Western world. 
and the Western world progress and prosper under those rules and the arrival of emerging economies entering those pro that prosperity is unstabilizing and unbalancing the world order. And therefore, for Canada as the major challenge so far, I mean, 21st century is so long, but in addition to climate change, it is how to re-engineer the world institutions, military, economic, social, multilateral institutions that, are, that could better correspond to the interests of the emerging economies. Brazil is unhappy, India is unhappy, China is unhappy, and then they are huge powers and they have done tremendously well in the last 25 years. And now you have a reaction in the Western world. And what is the reaction? Well, you know, Trump is to say, we lost all of our jobs uh, because the Chinese have not respected the rules. And then, uh, you know, The British are saying we want out of those uh, the European Union because too many rules impose on us and our sovereignty and so on. At one point, and it's coming faster than we think, and it will be for the young generation right there to pick up that challenge, we will have to sit down and say, hey guys, how do we re-engineer our world institutions? Because we're not going to be winners. The other side is going to win. And when I look at our campaign on the Security Council, I have one fear. Is potential activism of China against us. They have more clout in Latin America, more clout in Africa, more clout in Europe than we do. And if they decide that we are going to be a troublemaker on the UN Security Council for their own interests, they are not going to give us a free ride. <laughs> Thank you. Before we go into Q&A, I'd just uh, like to give our panel a, a big round of applause. I see Gary has his hand up already, um, and Gary, we will bring you a microphone, so just stand by. Stephanie is handling our microphone tonight. Uh, I was in uh, Australia visiting my sister a couple of years ago and in the morning the Australians put out their foreign policy in the afternoon logically they put out their defense policy uh, I'm not sure that uh, it's unfolding the way they'd hoped at least on the foreign policy side the question I have I guess is have we got a foreign policy do we need a foreign policy or are we going to have to be just quick footed who would like to take that on? Jill, would you like to take that on? Well, I'm not sure exactly what our foreign policy is at the moment, whether we have one. I, perhaps we do, but uh, maybe I could tell a little anecdote. One of my uh, last tasks in my before I retired was working, in fact, on a, a foreign policy, and we had multiple negotiations back and forth between various departments about what ought to go into that foreign policy and there were consultations. Um, and after months and months of agony, uh, the previous government decided they didn't want a foreign policy at all. And so we put it all back in the final cabinet and that was that. Um, 
So uh, I think it is actually important to have uh, some clear objectives to understand um, what your, where your interests are, where your values lie, uh, and how you plan to pursue those, and how you will uh, find the resources uh, in order to deliver. Um, but I'm not sure that we have any one such document at the moment. Um, although that's not to say that we've not been um, conducting an active foreign policy in a number of uh, a number of areas uh, with some success. So, from the from my perspective in the in the trenches and in foreign policy research, I mean, we don't necessarily we don't have a foreign policy document per se, but we do have some very clear guiding principles, and we have long term interests that have really not changed substantively over over time. So, you know, we've got the feminist international assistance policy. Um, we've got you know our, our our trade policies and so on and so. Really, from the point of view of a worker, um, I think we have we have clear clear marching orders, but we don't have what what a lot of us would like to see that that document that we could hand out and say, okay, these are you know these are Canada's five clear guiding principles based on these shared values, and you know this is our mission in the world. And I think in some ways that is a piece of what I kind of would have liked to have seen in the Security Council campaign. You know, I, I feel like we're asking people to, uh, to support us, countries to support us. Uh, and you know, to a large extent, a, a Security Council campaign is a ground game. Also in you know, getting individuals, uh, ministers or you know, ambassadors, permanent representatives in New York to say, you know, we're, we're supporting Canada rather than, than uh, somebody else. And without that, those, those very clear uh, points, it, it makes it hard. Mark, did you want to? I think it is very important to have a foreign policy because the prosperity of this country depends of our integration with the world. We are economically interdependent and more and more interdependent with the entire world. Therefore, you need to reflect and to ensure that you engage your citizen, your civil society, your stakeholders, your academic in reflecting about foreign issues. Sometimes it is esoteric. I am disappointed, saddened, I would say, that we don't have that the Prime Minister said no to the among debate. It would have been an occasion to raise the profile of the importance of foreign issues with Canadians. Because something happened, and we know, we look at China or United States, you know, I mean, a year ago we didn't know what, to, what was going to happen in our relationship with the United States. Well, you know, the prosperity of this province in the event depends on a, a fluid relationship with the United States. And not only this province, but the entire country. Therefore, the connection between world affairs, integration, economic interdependence and integrations, globalism. Trump said yesterday, that is against globalists. This is the most stupid things I've heard, you know, especially in the context of the United Nations. Now why is that? Why? Because the prosperity of the United States depends on economic integration in the world. And therefore, you know, we have we have this guy denouncing it. Well, we could not, we should not remain silent on it, and we should say foreign policy is important. Now, foreign policy is not an esoteric uh, policy like, uh, you know, somewhere. You have to ensure that you coordinate your aid policy, your military aid approach, your human rights policy, and, and 
your immigration policy. And you know what? If we win this seat at the United Nations, it will be because of our immigration policy. The only country in the world with open arms, welcoming 300,000 new immigrants year in, year out, is us. And if I would be the ambassador in New York, I would call on every single ambassador and say, who could match that? No one. Thank you, Mark. And we have a question at the back. Just while the microphone makes its way to you, um, speaking on the issue of foreign policy, and Gary, to your question, in 2017, we launched uh, our new defense policy, Strong, Secure, Engaged, at about 135 pages long, far exceeding anything that had happened in the last 10 years in terms of the number of pages. But Minister Freeland had to get up in the House of Commons the day before and deliver a very powerful foreign policy speech because I had the sense myself that some people might have thought defense policy was leading foreign policy. Just to reflect on your question. Um, there was mention of, uh, there was a lot of talk about the UN Security Council and um, one thing I've often thought though is with the Security Council how these five superpowers have veto power on on um, policies. It's like, well, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So what I've often thought and um, talked to many of my friends and school teachers about is would it be best if the Security Council was we just got rid of the Security Council, like every country, one country, one vote, and no country has veto power over the other. And who would like to handle that question? Well, you know, it's a good question. And it's, it, is, it is indeed a very good question. But you have to look from an historical perspective. Therefore, when you, when you address, if you want what to do, you want to get rid of it, you have to go back to the League of Nations. And you go back to the League of Nations, and suddenly the League of Nations was very weak because it was one country, one vote, and no, no executive committee looking at it. Therefore, it led, it led, not because of the League of Nations, but the League of Nations was not able to prevent the Second World War. They were not able to prevent the invasion of Ethiopia by Italy in 1936. They were not able to prevent the Spanish War, Civil War, or get involved in it. Therefore, the powers that be after the Second World War said, we need an executive body. We need an executive body that is representative and that is the main mission of that executive body is to ensure peace and security. So pr pretty much um, to make, to ensure that there is a person to make, that there is a body to make the final decision to prevent yeah. indecisiveness. Yeah. And then uh, and indecisiveness and even chaos. You know, I mean, it's, it's not, you are 193 and then everybody is, has a right to do something. It's a total chaos. You have to put, bring some order uh, to it. But your question is very relevant because nations are struggling to reform the Security Council. Should the veto powers persist? Should we have more permanent members or less? Should everybody be invited to compete with for a seat? But even between the 20, the 15 members, 
nobody agrees. And the reason nobody agrees on it is that the people with the veto power said, <laughs> I'm not going to lose my veto power. <laughs> and you have to work at it. You have to bring ideas. You have to reflect, to analyze, to try to find to find the right moment to change the government. The decline of institution in the world is because the governance is not adequate to respond to the world challenges. And therefore, you reflect on that. Work on the governance of the UN Security Council would be a tremendous contribution. Jill, would you like to, or Patrick? I don't think I have anything to add. Actually, yeah, but I think another question would be welcome. <laughs> All right. Um, I've got a. I've got. I'll come back up here. I've got a question down here. So. Uh, Good evening. Full disclosure: I'm a public international lawyer and the dean of the law school here, and I've reflected a little bit of false modesty in all of your presentations with, with respect. Because it's my view, and I'm so disappointed, that this is the time for Canada to take a leading role. Think about the International Criminal Court. Think about the Climate Change Convention. Think about the responsibility to protect. Canada has been instrumental in developing the international rule of law for 70 years. And the point is, what I'm so disappointed, I, I lived in the UK for the last 16 years, in coming back is that we don't seem to recognize that, that there is a major leadership gap in the international community. We've got Europe tearing itself apart with the Brits, we've got America in free fall. This is a good time for Christy Freeland and Trudeau, if he gets re-elected, to say, wait a minute here deal with problems of UN governance, deal with problems of human rights, and by the way, I totally agree with you, Patrick, there is a genocide going on in both of those situations that you've discussed, not to mention Syria and the Yazidi people. There have been genocides we haven't even responded to. It's shocking. And yet we, we were instrumental in developing those international rules of law, and yet we're not taking our leadership position. And I was just wondering if you have any suggestions as to how the rest of us might possibly pressure our government to take their, their role in leading what is a crisis in the international community. Thank you. Isn't there a public opportunity for that sometime in October? <laughs> Jill, would you like to weigh in? Well, I, I agree that I think there is a, a tremendous opportunity for Canada to play a role uh, given uh, some of the crisis in governance, really, that we see um, all around the world. But I also, if I look at the, the current federal election campaign, uh, I've heard scarcely a word about anything to do with foreign or defense policy. Um, and I think unless there is uh, a clear indication from civil society at large that foreign policy is a priority and something they want governments to pay attention to, um, I'm not saying that, uh, that it's not important for this government, but I think it will never be at the top of the, uh, at the, top of the agenda. I also think that governments, not just the Canadian government, are increasingly risk averse and um, people are afraid of uh, embarking on a, an issue that, has, uh, that is complicated, that is uh, potential for um, offending other partners, um, and uh, is likely to soak up uh, significant amounts of resources. Um, so I think those are some of the factors that are mitigating against um, uh, creative uh, foreign policy, but I do agree that there is a moment um, in where there, there are opportunities. Uh, not least because I think eventually that the tide will turn against some of the authoritarian governments or tendencies toward authoritarian government that we've seen, um, and then there will be an opportunity for countries like Canada to, to make a mark. Okay. 
at this point, thank the panel uh, and Chris for sharing their uh, years of knowledge and experience on the subject. So thank you very much. Uh, my question relates to the relationship between diplomats, professional diplomats, and uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, or politicians in general, actually. Uh, I've heard of uh, several uh, ex-diplomats speak over the last 18 months or so, and several of them, the, the sort of feeling I take back actually after those talk, listening to those talks, rightly or wrongly, is that there might be some disconnects actually, or that Foreign Affairs Canada or the Minister may not necessarily always heed the advice from the troops on the ground actually, i.e. the diplomats. Is that feeling right, wrong, comments? Appreciate it. Joe, would you like to start off because you were just recently in Moscow? Well, maybe sort of take a bit more of a, a broader historical perspective on this. And I think it, the role of uh, the public servant and the role of the politician uh, are, are very different. And um, the, the role of a public servant or a diplomat is to provide the best possible advice based on the information that they have, uh, that they have available to the ministers. Ministers then have to take that into consideration, weigh it against uh, their own political imperatives um, and bring that political lens to, to decision making. And I think, you know, in a, in a perfect world, there is that kind of creative tension between the political level and the, uh, and the public service. Uh, that's as it, as it should be. Um, sometimes it tilts a little bit in one direction or, uh, or the other. Um, and sometimes those relationships become um, more fraught than they sometimes ought to be. Um, and uh, I don't think I'm close enough to it today to, to say whether, uh, I've certainly seen relationships between public service and, uh, and political level uh, in a much worse state than they are uh, today. Um, and I think if you, if you hear about frictions, that, that, uh, that's not uh, abnormal. But I, I don't think I'm close enough to it to, to comment on, on it beyond that. But Mark, you long. <laughs> I've been gone for a long time. But uh, let me make two comments. Uh, it may have happened, and I would say that the Minister uh, of Foreign Affairs in the last uh, 12 to 14 months was totally absorbed by the relationship with the United States, how to properly manage that relationship, embark in the negotiations, and so on and so forth, and that was our prime responsibility. Therefore, all the other fives at the ministerial level were set aside or, you know, to be discussed down the line. Therefore, it, it, this disconnect may have happened. But I have to tell you that as a former ambassador, having served in, in three various, and we I see a lot of my colleagues here in the audience, and for the students, you may have an opportunity to see them. They, you have a lot of diplomatic experience in this room. Um, every single time I receive a minister, a prime minister, the governor general, but the, the political level, when I was in the field, they were captive. They were attentive. They were paying attention. They were interested. They were reading and wanted and seeking your advice. Therefore, the relationship between, in the field, between the political level and the, uh, the, the, the Canadian Foreign Service has always been, in my experience of 40 years, impeccable. In Ottawa, it is different. It is different because there is a lack of trust. Lack of trust. Trust is very important in our world, but trust in, 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 in government relationship and governance is very important. It's a key component, trust. 
the political level arrive without having the full trust towards the public service, be, be it the foreign service or the immigration path or something. You know, I mean, it's a, they did not have the, the trust. And foreign, the foreign service suffered a lot by this lack of trust, by this absence of, of confidence that exists and uh, under other governments. But if you read the memoirs, if you read the memoirs of former prime minister, former prime ministers will always praise the Canadian public service. And when I see the appointments of political appointees left and right in a more senior diplomatic job, we do that at our peril. Because the younger generation that should enter the Foreign Service or the Public Service of Canada, when they see that, they decide to go another route. And the experience will never be built. And that's where I think that in terms of governance, we need to reassess how we do things. Thank you, Mark. We have time for one more question. <clears throat> My name is Vic Lotto, and full disclosure, I've had 35 years in foreign service serving all over the place. Now, the nitty gritty, we've all been discussing these very interesting and useful topics, but the main point from a nitty gritty basis is the recruitment. I was really shocked to hear that there has been no input in the past seven years. Am I right in that? Um, well, not quite no input, but um, but very very much lower than than there was you know in normal years. I think the last uh, the last recruitment they they hired, I think it was about fifty people, and initially they were hired as terms, which was something that was unheard of uh, before. Yeah, they were on they were on two year contracts with no guarantee of, of being of you know, being kept on, and we did manage. I mean, over over that period of time, I mean, Passo advocated with the department. The department also wanted. I mean, they were concerned about budgets, basically, and making commitments to people for indeterminate contracts that they wouldn't be able to to keep. So it wasn't like they didn't want to keep people, but they were. You know, they needed to get that sorted out. So all those people have, I think, for the most part, been hired now, um, and they're, they're permanent. But, um, you know, it left a huge gap, and a number of people uh, decided not to stay or decided not to accept the offers. You know, people were, they were supposed to have been hired on a, a non-imperative basis for language, so they, you know, would have gotten training, and they got to a certain point in the selection process, and we're told, oh, by the way, we're now testing your language levels, and if you're not, uh, if you're not already bilingual, forget it, you know, we're not hiring you. So, the good news is that I understand from, from the personnel that they will soon be doing a recruitment, uh, a national recruitment through the public service recruitment mechanism. And we haven't heard for sure that it will be non-imperative, but we're hearing good noises that they have, they've listened to us, you know, in our point that you need to have a representative foreign service across the country, and that if you require that from the beginning, that you're really, you know, leaving out large, large hunks of, of the eligible pool. So, so we're, we're a little optimistic on that. that. That is promising news, but I, full disclosure, I did teach in the international I did in the business faculty, international business, a few years ago. And I saw so many promising candidates. And there are lots here as well. And uh, we have to encourage these people. And it's you, uh, AFSO, I guess, that's doing a very good job. Thank you. One of the hardwood jobs of being a moderator is calling an event to a close. Before, before we let you go, there are always lots of people behind the scenes that make an event like this work. First, it starts with Phil and the Retired Heads of Mission Association here that did the hard work to bring the panel together. We have the support from the Center for Global Studies, who are uh, 
uh, arranged the room and the filming. We have our own CIC crew, who also happen to be undergraduates of political studies crew as well, who managed to get the food here. This is the worst job. I wouldn't want to do this job. I would, I would mess it up. Um, I got the drinks here, live streaming the event, um, I think. Yes, we did manage to do that. I mean, it's, it's um, what makes an, act, uh, an activity like this actually work. We heard tonight, of course, old school diplomacy is still important. It actually should be not old school. It's what's required. And here in, in Victoria, we, of course, we have the Canadian International Council. And it's getting bigger every day. And networks are really important. And I'm really pleased to tell you that 17 students joined CIC today. And that puts us well over 100 students now in our organization. And it's bringing panelists together with this expertise, with younger people, that it's going to make the change that we've all been talking about tonight that we want to, to see in the future. So on behalf of all of us here, I'd like to thank our panelists very much for such a, a great evening. Thank you very much for coming this evening.